Recording by Barry Eads. Chapter Thirteen, Part One. Long before daylight, the camp at Nephi was astir. The cattle were driven out to water and pasture, while the men unchained the wheels and drew the wagons apart and clear for yoking in. The women cooked forty breakfasts over forty fires. The children, in the chill of dawn, clustered about the fires, sharing places here and there with the last relief of the night watch, waiting sleepily for coffee. It requires time to get a large train such as ours under way, for its speed is the speed of the slowest. So the sun was an hour high, and the day was already uncomfortably hot when we rolled out of Nephi and on into the sandy barrens. No inhabitant of the place saw us off. All chose to remain indoors, thus making our departure as ominous as they had made our arrival the night before. Again it was long hours of parching heat and biting dust, sagebrush and sand, and a land accursed. No dwellings of men, neither cattle nor fences, nor any sign of humankind, did we encounter all that day and at night we made our wagon circle beside an empty stream, in the damp sand of which we dug many holes that filled slowly with water seepage. Our subsequent journey is always a broken experience to me. We made camp so many times, always with the wagons drawn in circle, that to my child mind a weary long time passed after Nephi. But always, strong upon all of us, was that sense of drifting to an impending and certain doom. We averaged about fifteen miles a day. I know, for my father had said it was sixty miles to Fillmore, the next Mormon settlement, and we made three camps on the way. This meant four days of travel. From Nephi to the last camp of which I have any memory, we must have taken two weeks or a little less. At Fillmore the inhabitants were hostile, as all had been since Salt Lake. They laughed at us when we tried to buy food, and were not above taunting us with being Missourians. When we entered the place, hitched before the largest house of the dozen houses that composed the settlement were two saddle-horses, dusty, streaked with sweat, and drooping. The old man I have mentioned, the one with the long sunburnt hair and buckskin shirt, and who seemed a sort of aide or lieutenant to father, rode close to our wagon, and indicated the jaded saddle animals with a cock of his head. "'Not sparin' horse-flesh, Captain,' he muttered in a low voice. "'And what in the name of Sam Hill are they hard riding for, if it ain't for us?' But my father had already noted the condition of the two animals, and my eager eyes had seen him. And I had seen his eyes flash, his lips tighten, and haggard lines form for a moment on his dusty face. That was all. But I put two and two together, and knew that the two tired saddle-horses were just one more added touch of ominousness to the situation. "'I guess they're keeping an eye on us, Laban,' was my father's sole comment. It was at Fillmore that I saw a man that I was to see again. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man, well on in middle age, with all the evidence of good health and immense strength, strength not alone of body, but of will. Unlike most men I was accustomed to about me, he was smooth-shaven. Several days' growth of beard showed that he was already well grayed. His mouth was unusually wide, with thin lips tightly compressed as if he had lost many of his front teeth. His nose was large, square, and thick. So was his face square, wide between the cheekbones, underhung with massive jaws, and topped with a broad, intelligent forehead and the eyes, rather small, a little more than the width of an eye apart, were the bluest blue I had ever seen. It was at the flour mill at Fillmore that I first saw this man. Father, with several of our company, had gone there to try to buy flour, and I, disobeying my mother in my curiosity to see more of our enemies, had tagged along unperceived. This man was the one of four or five who stood in a group with the miller during the interview. "'You seen that smooth-faced old cuss?' Laban said to Father, after we had got outside and were returning to camp. Father nodded. "'Well, that's Lee,' Laban continued. "'I seen him in Salt Lake. He's a regular son of a gun. Got nineteen wives and fifty children, they all say. And he's rank crazy on religion. Now what's he following us up for through this God-forsaken country?' 
our weary doomed drifting went on the little settlements wherever water and soil permitted were from twenty to fifty miles apart between stretched the barrenness of sand and alkali and drought and at every settlement our peaceful attempts to buy food were vain they denied us harshly and wanted to know who of us had sold them food when we drove them from missouri it was useless on our part to tell them we were from arkansas from arkansas we truly were but they insisted on our being missourians at beaver five days journey south from fillmore we saw lee again and again we saw hard-ridden horses tethered before the houses but we did not see lee at parowan cedar city was the last settlement laban who had ridden on ahead came back and reported to father his first news was significant i seen that lee skedaddlin out as i rid in captain and there's more menfolk and horses in cedar city than the size of the place had warrant but we had no trouble at the settlement beyond refusing to sell us food they left us to ourselves the women and children stayed in the houses and though some of the men appeared in sight they did not as on former occasions enter our camp and taunt us it was at cedar city that the wainwright baby died i remember mrs wainwright weeping and pleading with laban to try to get some cow's milk it may save the baby's life she said and they've got cow's milk i saw fresh cows with my own eyes go on please laban it won't hurt you to try they can only refuse but they won't tell them it's for a baby a wee little baby mormon women have mothers hearts mormon women have mothers hearts they couldn't refuse a cup of milk for a wee little baby and laban tried but as he told father afterward he did not get to see any mormon women he saw only the mormon men who turned him away this was the last mormon outpost beyond lay the vast desert with on the other side of it the dreamland a the mythland of california as our wagons rolled out of the place in the early morning i sitting beside my father on the driver's seat saw laban give expression to his feelings we had gone perhaps half a mile and were topping a low rise that would sink cedar city from view when laban turned his horse around halted it and stood up in the stirrups where he had halted was a new-made grave and i knew it for the wainwright babies not the first of our graves since we had crossed the wasatch mountains he was a weird figure of a man aged and lean long-faced hollow-cheeked with matted sunburnt hair that fell below the shoulders of his buckskin shirt his face was distorted with hatred and helpless rage holding his long rifle in his bridle hand he shook his free fist at cedar city god's curse on all of you he cried out on your children and on your babes unborn may drought destroy your crops may you eat sand seasoned with the venom of rattlesnakes may the sweet water of your springs turn to bitter alkali may here his words became indistinct as our wagons rattled on but his heaving shoulders and brandishing fists attested that he had only begun to lay the curse that he expressed the general feeling in our train was evidenced by the many women who leaned from the wagons thrusting out gaunt forearms and shaking bony labored malformed fists at the last of mormondom a man who walked in the sand and goaded the oxen of the wagon behind ours laughed and waved his goad it was unusual that laugh for there had been no laughter in our train for many days give em hell laban he encouraged them's my sentiments and as our train rolled on i continued to look back at laban standing in his stirrups by the baby's grave truly he was a weird figure with his long hair his moccasins and fringed leggings so old and weather-beaten was his buckskin shirt that ragged filaments here and there showed where proud fringes once had been he was a man of flying tatters i remember at his waist dangled dirty tufts of hair that far back in the journey after a shower of rain were wont to show glossy black these i knew were indian scalps and the sight of them always thrilled me it will do him good father commended more to himself than to me i've been looking for days for him to blow up i wish he'd go back and take a couple of scalps i volunteered father regarded me quizzically don't like the mormons eh son 
I shook my head and felt myself swelling with the inarticulate hate that possessed me. When I grow up, I said after a minute, I'm going gunning for them. You, Jesse, came my mother's voice from inside the wagon. Shut your mouth instanter. And to my father, you ought to be ashamed letting the boy talk on like that. Two days' journey brought us to Mountain Meadows, and here, well beyond the last settlement, for the first time we did not form the wagon circle. The wagons were roughly in a circle, but there were many gaps, and the wheels were not chained. Preparations were made to stop a week. The cattle must be rested for the real desert, though this was desert enough in all seeming. The same low hills of sand were about us, but sparsely covered with scrub brush. The flat was sandy, but there was some grass, more than we had encountered in many days. Not more than a hundred feet from camp was a weak spring that barely supplied human needs, but farther along the bottom various other weak springs emerged from the hillsides, and it was at these that the cattle watered. We made camp early that day, and because of the program to stay a week there was a general overhauling of soiled clothes by the women, who planned to start washing on the morrow. Everybody worked till nightfall. While some of the men mended harness, others repaired the frames and ironwork of the wagons. There was much heating and hammering of iron and tightening of bolts and nuts. And I remember coming upon Laban, sitting cross-legged in the shade of a wagon, and sewing away till nightfall on a new pair of moccasins. He was the only man in our train who wore moccasins and buckskin, and I have an impression that he had not belonged to our company when it left Arkansas. Also, he had neither wife nor family nor wagon of his own. All he possessed was his horse, his rifle, the clothes he stood up in, and a couple of blankets that were hauled in the mason wagon. Next morning it was that our doom fell. Two days' journey beyond the last Mormon outpost, knowing that no Indians were about, and apprehending nothing from the Indians on any count, for the first time we had not chained our wagons in the solid circle, placed guards on the cattle, nor set a night watch. My awakening was like a nightmare. It came as a sudden blast of sound. I was only stupidly awake for the first moments and did nothing except to try to analyze and identify various noises that went to compose the blast that continued without let-up. I could hear near and distant explosions of rifles, shouts and curses of men, women screaming, and children bawling. Then I could make out the thuds and squeals of bullets that hit wood and iron in the wheels and under construction of the wagon. Whoever it was that was shooting, the aim was too low. When I started to rise, my mother, evidently just in the act of dressing, pressed me down with her hand. Father, already up and about, at this stage, erupted into the wagon. Out of it, he shouted, quick, to the ground. He wasted no time. With a hook-like clutch that was almost a blow, so swift was it, he flung me bodily out of the rear end of the wagon. I had barely time to crawl out from under when father, mother, and the baby came down pell-mell where I had been. "'Here, Jesse,' father shouted to me, and I joined him in scooping out sand behind the shelter of a wagon wheel. We worked barehanded and wildly. Mother joined in. "'Go ahead and make it deeper, Jesse,' father ordered. He stood up and rushed away in the gray light, shouting commands as he ran. I had learned by now my surname. It was Jesse Fancher. My father was Captain Fancher. Lie down! I could hear him. Get behind the wagon wheels and burrow in the sand. Family men, get the women and children out of the wagons. Hold your fire. No more shooting. Hold your fire and be ready for the rush when it comes. Single men, join Laban at the right. Cochran at the left, and me in the center. Don't stand up. Crawl for it. But no rush came. For a quarter of an hour the heavy and irregular fire continued. Our damage had come in the first moments of surprise, when a number of the early rising men were caught exposed in the light of the campfires they were building. The Indians, for Indians Laban declared them to be, had attacked us from the open, and were lying down and firing at us. In the growing light, father made ready for them. His position was near to where I lay in the burrow with mother, so that I heard him when he cried out, Now, all together! From left, right, and center, our rifles loosed in a volley. 
I had popped my head up to see, and I could make out more than one stricken Indian. Their fire immediately ceased, and I could see them scampering back on foot across the open, dragging their dead and wounded with them. All was work with us on the instant. While the wagons were being dragged and chained into the circle with tongues inside, I saw women and little boys and girls flinging their strength on the wheel spokes to help. We took toll of our losses. First, and gravest of all, our last animal had been run off. Next, lined about the fires they had been building, were seven of our men. Four were dead, and three were dying. Other men wounded, being cared for by the women. Little Rish Hardacre had been struck in the arm by a heavy ball. He was no more than six, and I remember looking on with mouth agape, while his mother held him on her lap, and his father set about bandaging the wound. Little Rish had stopped crying. I could see the tears on his cheeks while he stared wonderingly at the sliver of broken bone sticking out of his forearm. Granny White was found dead in the Foxwell wagon. She was a fat and helpless old woman who never did anything but sit down all the time and smoke a pipe. She was the mother of Abby Foxwell, and Mrs. Grant had been killed. Her husband sat beside her body. He was very quiet. There were no tears in his eyes. He just sat there, his rifle across his knees, and everybody left him alone. Under father's directions, the company was working like so many beavers. The men dug a big rifle pit in the center of the corral, forming a breastwork out of the displaced sand. Into this pit the women dragged bedding, food, and all sorts of necessities from the wagons. All the children helped. There was no whimpering and little or no excitement. There was work to be done, and all of us were folks born to work. The big rifle pit was for the women and children. Under the wagons, completely around the circle, a shallow trench was dug and an earthwork thrown up. This was for the fighting men. Laban returned from a scout. He reported that the Indians had withdrawn the matter of half a mile and were holding a powwow. Also, he had seen them carry six of their number off the field, three of which, he said, were debtors. From time to time, during the morning of that first day, we observed clouds of dust that advertised the movements of considerable bodies of mounted men. These clouds of dust came toward us, hemming us in on all sides but we saw no living creature. One cloud of dirt only moved away from us. It was a large cloud, and everybody said it was our cattle being driven off. And our forty great wagons that had rolled over the Rockies and half across the continent stood in a helpless circle. Without cattle, they could roll no farther. At noon, Laban came in from another scout. He had seen fresh Indians arriving from the south, showing that we were being closed in. It was at this time that we saw a dozen white men ride out on the crest of a low hill to the east and look down on us. That settles it, Laban said to father. The Indians have been put up to it. They're white like us, I heard Abby Foxwell complain to mother. Why don't they come in to us? They ain't whites, I piped up, with a wary eye for the swoop of mother's hand. They're Mormons. That night, after dark, three of our young men stole out of camp. I saw them go. They were Will Aiding, Abel Milliken, and Timothy Grant. They are heading for Cedar City to get help, father told mother, while he was snatching a hasty bite of supper. Mother shook her head. There's plenty of Mormons within calling distance of camp, she said. If they won't help, and they haven't shown any signs, then the Cedar City ones won't either. But there are good Mormons and bad Mormons, father began. We haven't found any good ones so far, she shut him off. Not until morning did I hear of the return of Abel Milliken and Timothy Grant, but I was not long in learning. The whole camp was downcast by reason of their report. The three had gone only a few miles when they were challenged by white men. As soon as Will Aiden spoke up, telling that they were from the Fancher Company, going to Cedar City for help, he was shot down. Milliken and Grant escaped back with the news, and the news settled the last hope in the hearts of our company. The whites were behind the Indians, and the doom so long apprehended was upon us. This morning of the second day our men, going for water, were fired upon. The spring was only a hundred feet outside our circle, but the way to it was commanded by the Indians who now occupied the low hill to the east. 
It was close range, for the hill could not have been more than fifteen rods away. But the Indians were not good shots, evidently, for our men brought in the water without being hit. Beyond an occasional shot into camp, the morning passed quietly. We had settled down in the rifle pit, and being used to rough living, were comfortable enough. Of course it was bad for the families of those who had been killed, and there was the taking care of the wounded. I was forever stealing away from mother in my insatiable curiosity to see everything that was going on, and I managed to see pretty much of everything. Inside the corral, to the south of the big rifle pit, the men dug a hole and buried the seven men and two women all together. Only Mrs. Hastings, who had lost her husband and father, made much trouble. She cried and screamed out, and it took the other women a long time to quiet her. On the low hill to the east the Indians kept up a tremendous powwowing and yelling, but beyond an occasional harmless shot they did nothing. "'What's the matter with the ornery cusses?' Laban impatiently wanted to know. "'Can't they make up their minds what they're going to do, and then do it?' It was hot in the corral that afternoon. The sun blazed down out of a cloudless sky, and there was no wind. The men, lying with their rifles in the trench under the wagons, were partly shaded, but the big rifle pit, in which were over a hundred women and children, was exposed to the full power of the sun. Here, too, were the wounded men, over whom we erected awnings of blankets. It was crowded and stifling in the pit, and I was forever stealing out of it to the firing line, and making a great to-do at carrying messages for father. Our grave mistake had been in not forming the wagon circle so as to enclose the spring. This had been due to the excitement of the first attack, when we did not know how quickly it might be followed by a second one. And now it was too late. At fifteen rods' distance from the Indian position on the hill, we did not dare unchain our wagons. Inside the corral, south of the graves, we constructed a latrine, and north of the rifle pit in the center, a couple of men were told off by father to dig a well for water. In the mid-afternoon of that day, which was the second day, we saw Lee again. He was on foot, crossing diagonally over the meadow to the northwest, just out of rifle shot from us. Father hoisted one of Mother's sheets on a couple of ox goads lashed together. This was our white flag, but Lee took no notice of it, continuing on his way. Laban was for trying a long shot at him, but Father stopped him saying that it was evident the whites had not made up their minds what they were going to do with us, and that a shot at Lee might hurry them into making up their minds the wrong way. "'Here, Jesse,' father said to me, tearing a strip from the sheet and fastening it to an ox goad. "'Take this and go out and try to talk to that man. Don't tell him anything about what's happened to us. Just try to get him to come in and talk with us.' As I started to obey, my chest swelling with pride in my mission— Jed Dunham cried out that he wanted to go with me. Jed was about my own age. "'Dunham, can your boy go along with Jesse?' father asked Jed's father. Two's better than one. They'll keep each other out of mischief.' So Jed and I, two youngsters of nine, went out under the white flag to talk with the leader of our enemies. But Lee would not talk. When he saw us coming, he started to sneak away. We never got within calling distance of him and after a while he must have hidden in the brush, for we never laid eyes on him again, and we knew he couldn't have got clear away. Jed and I beat up the brush for hundreds of yards all around. They hadn't told us how long we were to be gone, and since the Indians did not fire on us, we kept on going. We were away over two hours, though had either of us been alone, he would have been back in a quarter of the time. But Jed was bound to outbrave me, and I was equally bound to outbrave him. Our foolishness was not without profit. We walked boldly about under our white flag, and learned how thoroughly our camp was beleaguered. To the south of our train, not more than half a mile away, we made out a large Indian camp. Beyond, on the meadow, we could see Indian boys riding hard on their horses. Then there was the Indian position on the hill to the east. We managed to climb a low hill so as to look into this position. Jed and I spent half an hour trying to count them, and concluded, with much guessing, that there must be at least a couple of hundred. 
Also, we saw white men with them, and doing a great deal of talking. Northeast of our train, not more than four hundred yards from it, we discovered a large camp of whites behind a low rise of ground, and beyond we could see fifty or sixty saddle horses grazing, and a mile or so away to the north we saw a tiny cloud of dust approaching. Jed and I waited until we saw a single man, riding fast, gallop into the camp of the whites. When we got back into the corral, the first thing that happened to me was a smack from Mother for having stayed away so long. But Father praised Jed and me when we gave our report. "'Watch for an attack now, maybe, Captain,' Aaron Cochran said to Father. "'That man the boy's seen has rid in for a purpose. The whites are holding the Indians till they get orders from higher up. Maybe that man brung the orders one way or the other. They ain't sparing horse flesh. That's one thing, sure.' Half an hour after our return, Laban attempted to scout under a white flag, but he had not gone twenty feet outside the circle when the Indians opened fire on him and sent him back on the run. End of chapter 13, part 1